I came across this book, Humbug Land, the other day, and it caught my eye because it says, Being the Report of Mendez Pinto. And if you've been uh, listening to Tartarian Tales, he is the hero of that series, pretty much, in the book that I read a lot of the time. It's concerning a man-like creature inhabiting the Earth during the 17th eon. And it's a commentary on humanity at the time. And it, according to archive.org, it's from 1916 by a man named Neander P. Cook. And uh, I guess he went by the pseudonym of Mendez Pinto. So I'm not sure what the connection is there and why he particularly did that. But I found this very interesting because I was researching Mendez Pinto from Tartarian Tales in those books and that author. And I came across this and I just couldn't put it down. It's very interesting. It, look at these chapters. It's a 44-page quick read. I'm going to read the intro. It has a lot of interesting concepts. And it's from the perspective of an immortal, which I believe is pretty much someone that thinks like us, like us truth seekers, us that see through the evil and try to remain healthy and stray from it at all costs. I don't agree with all of it necessarily, but there is a lot that is amazing and I think you will all enjoy it and the concepts are very interesting and so true. And one of them they talk about a tree and you'll see what I mean later on, but you'll never look at trees the same. It's You never know. Sometimes random writings just kind of hit you at the right time at the right spot and have interconnected things and synchronicities that lead you to it and this is one of those so very interesting I'm gonna read the first about nine pages I recommend you check out the rest I'll include the link below it really has nothing to do with the Mendez Pinto we know but look Mendez Pinto pseudonym for Neander P. Cook just fascinating you never know what we get, where the path is going to lead here we go all the beasts of prey which at present inhabit the earth are divided into four tribes, black, yellow, brown, and white. Of these, the white are the most numerous as well as the most destructive and ferocious. Belonging to the living creation, even these perverted creatures have something in common with ourselves, the immortals, for they possess many faculties, both of mind and body, which may be regarded as of the same order of nature, only less perfect and refined. They exhibit some capacity to feel, for on occasion they seem to act elated or depressed. Also, they have some gift of reason, but their conclusions and interferences are either queer or false. No doubt our learned investigators are right that this plague of the earth is one of the latest products of animal evolution, for no other class of creatures would appear so imperfect, so self-contradictory, so unresponsive to instinct, so helpless, so deceitful, so cunning, so depraved, so senseless, so brutal, so bloodthirsty, so implacable an enemy of all that lives and grows as these coxcomb creatures who call themselves human beings. It looks as if their creation is the worst mistake which has happened to our mother nature. But as with all other evil things, so man also bears within himself the seeds of his ultimate destruction. And in that fair day when there shall no longer be any blot upon the face of the earth or sky, the memory of man will linger only in our museums as an extinct monster of cruelty which had but a momentary existence in the progress of evolution. But while man remains, he is a great plague to all living things, both to plants and animals, and were it not for our own ethereal bodies, we immortals also would suffer from his degradations. Therefore, I was appointed by our honorable 632nd assembly to make a complete study of this creature's habits and life history in order to see if we shall continue in our practice to let all living things pursue unhindered the course of their existence, be it good or evil, or whether this plague, which in the last moon seems to increase so inordinately, should be hastened to its destruction by our acts of higher wisdom. I have therefore faithfully performed my task according to the confidence of our associates in me and submit herewith the following report. The mental structure of the human creature, not yet dry behind the ears. The mental constitution of mankind is related to that of other animals, but is of a more unstable and deleterious nature. Man's instincts are still uncorrelated, for the time of his existence, compared with other creatures, is very short. He has not yet gained any real evolutionary experience, 
Therefore his soul and mind still grope in the dark and are the prey of every illusion and delusion that thought and emotion are capable of. He cannot distinguish between truth and falsehood, for his sense perception is both limited and deceptive, attuned to but a few octaves of sound and light. The eye of one man sees a thing red, and the eye of another sees a thing green. Likewise, it is with his emotions. The same sentiment will stir one man into fury and leave another cold and apathetic, which is a fruitful cause of his never-ending and stupid quarrels. Furthermore, man's sense of smell is nearly atrophied and his taste is perverted, so he is blind and deaf to all the great harmonies of the universe, which every moment surge through our being, for we ethereals are attuned to the entire range of nature's music. Our bodies are all eye, all ear, for we are made of light in the luminiferous ether is the essence of our being. There is nothing far nor near, nothing high nor low, nothing past nor future, which does not register itself in our sensitiveness. For each of us is part of, of the all that is and ever shall be, and the course of our being has run from immortality to that which is mortal. We fall and we rise, we disappear and appear again, and ecstasy is the end of our being. Not so is man. He conceives that he was born to plague himself with labor and weariness and that the end of his being is sorrow and weeping and that he was created for toil and tribulation. Therefore he has so formed his social structure that the many are slaves and the few are rulers, and his virtues are obedience and the carrying of burdens for others. His morality is like unto that of dogs who fawn upon the hand that beats them and whose greatest happiness is their master's commendation. Their ambition is to be good and faithful servants who toil all day for their Lord and then wait upon him at table, glad to subsist upon the crumbs he drops to the floor. For us immortals, in whom the love of liberty is so strong that we would perish sooner than perform a day's slave toil at the command of another, and who render obedience to none, save to truth and wisdom, it is difficult to conceive of the existence of so slavish a race as is mankind, for there does not seem to be a single human being but what he feels himself beholden to some authority over him. Yet all animals outside of the dog tribes are endowed with self-direction and repudiate every authority over themselves save the urge of their own being, for liberty is among the pristine gifts of life. But man was asleep when the goddess of freedom passed by, and she departed in a dudgeon from the human race because she was not wooed intently enough. This is some beautiful stuff, uh, very right for now. Here we go. Three, his brain box, the suckling of cow milk and barley water. When we put a human specimen upon the dissecting table, the first thing peculiar which strikes us and which mass matches man from other animals is his big head and overgrowth of brain. At any rate, something is wrong in this brain box, for it seems to interfere continuously with the normal instincts which man was, has inherited from the nobler animals which were his forebearers. So he does not drink water which supports the life processes of his organism, but he drinks alcohol to wreck his body. He stews himself in opium and tobacco juice and drugs himself out of the little sense he naturally might have had. It is this brain of his which makes him do all the unnatural things of which he is guilty, which perverts every truth of nature and makes him the subject of delusions and hysterias and causes wars among them, in which they blindly rush at each other to destroy themselves. Nowhere in nature have ever appeared such evils as the human brain has invented. Murder, war, tyranny, prison houses, tortures, and other crazes and manias unnumbered. Physically, man is soon becoming the wreck he is striving so hard to make of himself. His body is bony and crooked and shot through with disease. He can no longer grow his own teeth, they are made in a factory, and their women's breasts are dried up so that they must feed their infants on cow milk and barley water. Yet it is especially those whom they count great among themselves which are the most degenerated and helpless. These great ones cannot put sugar in their own coffee, but must have butlers standing behind their chairs while they eat to wait upon them. Their princesses cannot hook their own gowns or keep clean their fingernails or wash their own hair. More than one half the members of the white race does not know how to grow its own wheat or vegetables or fruit, so they eat embalmed beef out of tin cans and sip soda water colored with coal tar dyes. Yet man is as proud of his swell head as a gobbler is of his wattles. He regards it almost as the jewel of creation, the seat of his intelligence and reason. But our scientists set no great store by either reason or intelligence or brainstorms, 
for in all the wonderful achievements of the living evolution, the human brain has had little or no part. It is not the seat of instincts, which alone can be transmitted from parents to offspring. An instinct, not reason or intelligence, is the foundation stone of life. In man, the brain is the organ of self-consciousness and conceit, aside from its physiological function of being the central station of the sensory motor reflex. Man is very proud that he can read and write by means of this wonderful brain of his, so that when a road is properly signposted, he can find his way home. But a bird can travel a thousand miles without a compass, and a dog can smell his way home, and can scent the track of man and animals without having to look it up in the encyclopedia. Man greatly values the store of knowledge which he has piled up in the books of his libraries, but three-fourths of these tomes of wisdom are filled with arguments of his duty to obey the decrees of his masters and respect the authority of those set over him, and to be content with his crust. We immortals set no store by such things, for we continually seek to widen the realm of freedom and to add to the intensity and excitement of life. We consider it worthwhile to scale the dizzy heights in order to see new horizons, to climb the mountain peak for the exhilaration of tobogganing down its side with the speed of lightning. Everywhere the living world is playing with nature's forces to contrive a wilder ride through space. As for the rest of man's cold stored knowledge, I have found nothing in his books which the flowers and trees, the birds or the insects, did not know a thousand years before his time. Man thinks his microscope and telescope, his x-ray and his flying machine achievements worthy of these gods. He admires his diamond dyes and claims to have harnessed the forces of nature in steam and electrical engines. But how insignificant are all these things when compared with the achievements of the instincts of animals and plants? Human intelligence can build a microscope, but instinct is able to evolve the eye itself. Man can make an organ, but instinct produces the ear. Instinct invented the flight of birds of millions of years before man invented an aeroplane, and the electric fish, by instinct, grows in an infinitely more effective battery than man produces. The instinct of plants can distill the most beautiful colors out of the brown earth. The lowliest green algae, yeah, every blade of grass or green leaf, can use the most available natural energy, viz. the light of the sun, in the chemical factory of its organism. Every green thing in nature is a wonderful factory run by sun motors, clean and bright, but man can only make smoke. Man's knowledge and the achievement of his reason play no part in the larger life of the cosmos, for they cannot be transmitted from parent to offspring. Reason is merely a byproduct of evolution, of value only as a satisfaction of the wonder instinct. Man considers himself infinitely superior to all other creatures. Of course, this is a vanity quite common among living things. Each species considers itself the pinnacle of creation and claims to have mounted to the top rung of the ladder. So, for instance, think the flea and cootie who look upon man as infinitely beneath them, as nothing more than their feeding ground. And in fact, they quite successfully match their wit against man's. So likewise do numberless bacilli, and the instinctive powers of these simple organisms are by no means inferior to those of man. If we are to consider one creature higher than another in the scale of evolution, it is among the plants where creation's highest achievements are recorded. Sessile by nature, yet by their ingenuity they send their offspring over the entire habitable globe, and they leave no force of nature nor psychic peculiarity of any animal unused to accomplish their end. Some put their seeds into balloons and send them drifting upon the clouds. Others shoot it from their pods as with guns. But when animals appeared, the plants immediately made the whole animal kingdom their servant, for there is no animal of any kind but what must perform unconscious service for the plants, and whenever the wit of man or animals becomes pitted against the instinct of the plant, the plant generally comes out ahead. Numberless instincts must be Cupid's willing or unwilling messenger whenever a pistol desires to mate with her prince charming of the far distant flower. They say that love knows no barrier, but it is among the plants where the seemingly insurmountable obstacles are overcome in the most ingenious manner. Here is a cherry tree which wishes to establish its children in a new country hundreds of miles distant. It saw that the birds sitting in its branches could fly through the air to that new country and straightway it determined to make them its servants. Even we immortals do not yet understand how the cherry tree's instinct learned so much about the nature of birds. Many plants have discovered that most animals have a sweet tooth and whenever they want an animal to do anything for them, they offer a morsel of sugar or honey. This is the universal money of the plant world, and it is always acceptable at par in the animal kingdom. 
Does the flower in its gorgeous wedding dress sigh for a lover from afar? It offers a bit of nectar to wasp or bee or butterfly as payment for the prince's aeroplane ride. But the cherry tree was chiefly solicitous for its offspring. It did not want to start its children in barren soil. Worn out by the parent roots, it meant to plant them in a virgin paradise. So it grew ripe red cherries of exactly the flavor which the bird's palate craved beyond anything in the world. The bird, eating the cherry, would carry the stone in its stomach miles distant and drop it upon new soil. We do not know how the cherry tree knew so exactly to the taste of the birds, nor how that red color was so fascinating to them, nor how it learned the intricate chemical process to distill the sweet pulp out of earth and air, nor whence it gets its wonderful color. Evidently, it spared no pains in offering such royal feast, and this is the one thing in which plants are always much fairer than animals. Though they make animals their servants, they always pay handsomely for any service rendered, while animals, and especially man, the most beastly of all animals, simply destroy and spoil and never give thought of fair return. It is in retaliation for this wanton spoliation that the plants are compelled to send the bacteria into the animal organism in order to destroy the destroyer and make his carcass again available for plant food. But the cherry tree knows still more. While it offers the bird the juicy pulp, it embeds its offspring in a hard stone case, proof against the powerful acids of the bird's stomach, yet open to the water of the soil when germinating time comes. Moreover, so long as the seed is still immature, it keeps its cherry green and so horribly sour no bird will touch it. All animals are parasites upon plants, and as a parasite cannot easily reach to the perfection of its host, it is probably for this reason that evolution has made so much less progress among animals than it has made in the plant world. Among animals, insects have reached the highest perfection, and among the vertebrates, the birds have reached a comparatively high stage, while on the other hand, the carnivora, such as lions, tigers, wolves, dogs, and men, occupy a comparatively low plane. In the world's evolutionary history, man has been of less account than any other species, and it is not apparent that he is destined to play any important role. The first universal ice age would wipe him out if he does not before that time destroy himself by the follies of his reason. In fact, the living world as a whole could get along much better without him. So long as he remained an uncivilized son of nature, he did little harm. But in these last eons, owing to his civilization, that vile product of the overgrowth of his brain, he has become an intolerable plague in nature, denuding the surface of the earth of every green tree, like an insect plague that devours field and forest. But plagues do not last forever, and the plant world will not suffer extirpation by civilized man, but will send the seeds of destruction into his own being. When he has destroyed the paradise in which he was planted, his bones will rot on the bare rocks and the seeds of plants which have rested a while, he chewed the forest into paper pulp, will celebrate a new resurrection day and grow upon his carcass. Then flowers once more will bloom in a better world. Human conscience and morality, who is right, nature's God or man's conscience? As a peacock is proud of its tail, so man is proud of his conscience and of his morality. It is the strangest product of his brain box which tells him that it is wicked to play, to enjoy nature's gifts of goodness, to bask in sun and air, to loiter by the brookside and stroll among the meadow flowers or roam at will in the forest temple and quaff the whole of the delight of life. Nature's commandment to all creation is, Six days shalt thou live and delight thyself, and on the seventh day thou shalt take thy fill of pleasure. But man has changed this divine oracle and says, Six days shalt thou sweat and weary thyself, and on the seventh thou shalt hide thyself from the wrath of Jehovah, and touch not which might delight thy soul. For in sackcloth and ashes shalt thou worship thy God, as if he were some tyrant whose sole satisfaction is in the scourging of his slaves. Yet men exalt their conscience to be the highest law of the universe. I know of scarce anything akin to it in nature, except perhaps among dogs who feel remorse at their master's scolding, whether it be just or unjust. The commands of the human conscience are almost all directly contrary to the God-given natural instincts. For conscience's sake, men inflict all sorts of misery upon themselves, but never seek to do what that which is good in nature. For conscience's sake, they fast and scourge themselves, abstain from joy and pleasure, bind themselves down to the burden of toil, and endure slavery. But on the other hand, for conscience's sake, they never throw off the master's yoke or seek the liberty which is theirs by birthright. 
On the contrary, in the name of conscience, they sacrificed their children to Juggernaut, to Moloch, to Jave, and to Ogre of War. For conscience's sake, they swear to their own hurt and keep the vows that do them harm. Truly, no such stupidity was ever before heard of in creation. In a similar manner, the whole human code of morality is based upon the idea of abstinence from that which is good and that the endurance of suffering is the golden path to virtue. So men are ever afraid lest there be too much feasting in life, too much laughter, too much play, too much dancing, too much frolic and sunshine, too much freedom, too much pleasure, too much vacation, for it is only of these and other good things that their conscience upbraids them. It never condemns them for overwork, for fatigue, for undernourishment, for dirt, for shabbiness, for pain, for tears, for poverty, for lack of artistic attainment, for broken health and wrinkles before their time, for lack of vision and travel and opportunity for sightseeing. Yet all these are high crimes and treason against life and nature, for nature abhors the dwarfed and stunted growths and mercifully blots out the maimed in the struggle for existence, for it meant that its world should be fair and without spot and blemish. The capering colt, the prancing steed, exuberance of health and beauty and glory of form and fullness of life are her goal. But man's morality insists upon starving both his body and soul, so that he alone of all living things falls far short of what his natural endowments enable him to be. And from all creation the indignant protest goes up to the eternal throne against the race that has filled its days with pain and sorrow and knows no sound but the wailing of self-inflicted misery, and ever refuses to so change its course of life that it may become part of heaven's peen of joy and tumultuous happiness. Yet there did appear one among them to teach them the ways of life, who did not fast as the disciples of John and the Pharisees, but who taught that life is a wedding feast and that it were unbecoming for its guests to fast while the bridegroom is with them. But him they did not heed. They choked his voice in blood. Well, so then I'm just going to end with this last one because this one's a good one too and it's pretty quick. And then I'll just talk about a little bit of stuff because this is awesome. It's really pointing out our faults and the way that our controllers have made the world and that's what needs to change most about now. All right, here we go. Five, page eight. Human cruelty to their young. I thought this was good because this has become very apparent since I would become a parent and the way that I think is a lot different than the way that uh, you're told to think and people online treat their kids the way my instinct is is very pure just like this not the way things have become and that's the way it should always be so I thought this chapter was interesting human cruelty to their young most spare not the rod it says most animals show a very tender regard toward their young especially during the period of infancy they devote the greater part of their time to hunt food for them or else spend it in playing with them in order to teach their offspring the sum total of animal lore which they possess, to train them in dexterity in all tricks useful against their enemies, etc. Our learned sages have not recorded anywhere that animals willingly harm or torture their offspring during the period of immaturity and growth. Since the humans are an offshoot from some of the older animals, they have inherited many of the beautiful and noble virtues found in the animal creation, and so it comes that a young mother will grieve as much as other animals do should her infant die. If, however, the child lives, it is not long before she begins to abuse it. As soon as the period of lactation is passed, she begins to beat it with switches or rods, or slaps it in anger, or tortures it in order to break its will and train it to slavish obedience. Even their sacred books teach them to beat their children and not to spare the rod. Thus the life of the human infant is the most miserable of all animals, even if it be born to the gold and purple, in a mansion or a king's palace, since among these great ones the mother considers it undignified to suckle her own infant. She dries up her breasts and turns the child over to servants, who naturally abuse it still more than would its own parents. So very interesting i'll stop there because i could read on it's just so good but i won't but that is a very true thing and there's so much going on that has just become a part of culture a part of whatever they've convinced us of this of this massive propaganda of pretty much every area of our lives and they've led us astray in every area and with childbirth it's so common now to be to get advice that's just terrible to be taught to break your children and no animals do that. It's not right. It doesn't feel right. And everyone knows it does, but they still do it because it's their selfishness. And there's so many things that kind of come into play here and how this immortal looks down at the humans. And I have a feeling a lot of you out there 
have these same characteristics as the immortals, not the bad humans he's describing that are the plague, no matter what race you are. It's, I mean, that's just irrelevant here and to me in general. But I have a feeling the people that are listening to this are of the type that were describing these low, kind of lower forms of human, these people that are obsessed with things that don't matter, these, things, these people that just pollute their health, just crush the miracle around us, and do everything to crush other people's miracle instead of people like us who want to see everyone thrive, want a renaissance, we want to discover, we want to know truth, we want to know the miracles, we want to know the ether, we want to get back to a time when all these buildings that are around us now, all these Tartarian-esque and ancient structures were functioning when they were built, when human humanity was in harmony with whether giants or something else, all animals were in harmony at one point, we know it, we can feel it. And that's what we have to get back to. And in order to do that, we have to acknowledge the faults of the past generations and of humanity itself. And that way we can correct it and use only the great stuff. Life is perfect. This is all perfect. We all must remember that. We must be taught that from birth forever. We are forever. Bless you all.